He's all I need. He's all you need. He's all we need. <laughs> Turn in your Bibles, if you will, please, to Ephesians, the fifth chapter, as we continue to journey our way through Ephesians, the Ephesian text. You recall in the earlier message today, we were looking at the pitiful church. It's the church at Ephesus. And as you recall, one of the problems there, the major problem of Jesus' uh, condemnation for what they were doing, they'd left their first love, the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I get a, a better glimpse each time I study through the Ephesians text as to why that was said. In fact, in the Ephesians text in the fourth chapter, we've already seen where the Apostle Paul has given them instructions uh, to put off the old man and put on the new man to remove uh, bitterness from the heart and to let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away. He had given them instructions on what to put away from one's life if we are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And there was to be no corrupt communication in verse 29 in chapter 4. Uh, the thing that is so prevalent that you see in the first five verses of the fifth chapter is a continuation of that thought. Stand, if you will, please, out of honor and recognition of the reading of the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. <clears throat> As I read audibly, follow with me silently in your Scripture. Be ye therefore followers of God, as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice of God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and uncleanness and covetousness, uh, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish uh, talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger or unclean person or covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Thank you, and we may be seated. <clears throat> Powerful statement by the Apostle Paul, and keep in mind he's writing from a prison cell as he writes this as one of the prison epistles. The Apostle Paul is reminding the reader at the church at Ephesus to be aware of the primary thing, and the primary thing is to emulate God, to emulate. Jesus. Uh, Paul said in one of his epistles, uh, follow me as I follow Christ. The word there follows the word emulate, imitate, uh, follow, be like. And if we would pause for a moment and just think, and most of us have children that we've brought up, and I find it fascinating that we can say, son, don't do this, daughter, don't do that, don't go there, stop doing this. Do you realize that a child will follow what you do more than what you say? A child is going to watch the parent and emulate the parent in what the child is doing. May I remind us that parents, especially dads, more than just obeying what he said, the child is going to obey and follow in his footsteps. As a believer, we should emulate, emulate, imitate, follow the Father, our Heavenly Father, just as a son or daughter follows the earthly parent. Believers are to live and look like Christians, to believe, in the Word of God, to act like, walk like, talk like a Christian or two. We are to put off the old conduct, the old characteristics of the old lost personality and put on the attributes of the Lord Jesus Christ. How should we then live? And these few verses are filled with what I call little golden nuggets in the word study and the analysis of what the text is saying that gives a good, good, good overview of how a Christian should live, how we should walk, how our talk and life should emulate that of the Lord. How should we live? This text says that we should be walking in love. Remember in the fourth chapter, the first six verses, it talked about walking worthy. Chapter, se uh, chapter 4, verse 7 through 16, we're to walk in unity. Chapter uh, 4, verse 17 through 32, we're to walk in holiness. And here we're to walk emulating God himself, following him. You remember uh, God's word says, God speaking, be ye holy as I am holy. I think we forget about the holiness of God 
and the mandate of Scripture for the holiness of the Christian in our lives. So as we think on the subject, emulating God, I want us to look at three basic things in these five brief verses. I want us to notice the principal concept revealed in verse 1. I want us to see the premier copy replicated in verse 2 and the personal conduct restricted in verses 3, 4, and 5 that is before us in this text. Notice the principal concept revealed in that first verse. If you've ever lived on a farm, or if you've witnessed the farmer, the old farmers as they're plowing in the field uh, with the mule and the plow, and there's some that have had uh, pictures of it in some of the old books and some of the uh, musings over the old country life, and it will show the farmer uh, plowing the mule, and uh, here's the son, here's the father with his long steps following the mule. And I will forget one indication and a picture of that where the little son looked like maybe four or five years old, following dad, riding the plowed row, trying to place his feet right in dad's footprints. And that's exactly what we find this text talking about today, is emulating and following the pattern set forth in the Word of God by God himself. Note the exhortation that's recorded there. Be ye therefore... When you see a word, therefore, you look to see what's gone, therefore. Be ye therefore, based on what Paul has just said in the previous verses, be ye therefore followers of God. When we're saved, we have a new life. It's the Christian life. You've heard me say before, and may I remind us again for emphasis, when we get saved, the old man's not dead. The old man is still alive. The old sin nature is still there. The old uh, whisper in the ear of Satan giving directions is still present. But the new man, the new me, the new you, is there when we say yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. There is a war that's taking place. And in the sixth chapter of this same uh, book, this same Bible text, in the sixth chapter we find the Apostle Paul talking about the need to put on the whole armor of God. If you look at the previous verses, the previous uh, chapters in Ephesians, when you get to the sixth chapter, we understand completely why the Apostle Paul is talking about the warfare and the spiritual warfare that we're in and the need to put on the whole armor of God to be able to defend against Satan and his attacks. But this scripture says that we're to be followers of God. When we get saved, we have a new name, a new birth, a new family, a new life, and we are the children of God. And therefore, the exhortation is to be followers of God. What does it mean, followers? It means literally to copy, to mimic, to imitate. We're to copy, to mimic, to imitate our Heavenly Father, God, in the Scripture. And the only way that's possible, if I can just insert this little thought, the only way that's possible for a Christian to imitate God is to know God through God's Word. If we do not study the Word, if we do not meditate on the Word, if we do not hide the Word of God in our hearts, we have no idea what God is saying or who God is or how we're to imitate and follow God Himself. We are to be imitators of God. That means to copy, to imitate God's holiness, His attributes of love and holiness in our lives. Don't copy or imitate the world. Don't copy or imitate what the world says and the attributes of the world. Many in the world today are wanting to copy and emulate and imitate those sports stars just as the one that's in the news today. In fact, I roll the dial trying desperately to find other news. My bride can tell you, I put the controls down. I said, there's no other news on the globe but of the one that was just, uh, his life was just taken in a helicopter crash. Kobe Bryant. And they interviewed many, many, many people from every walk of life, especially those in the sports arena, the sports field, and all of them were talking about how Kobe Bryant wanted to emulate uh, uh, Johnson, Magic Johnson. And there were others in his life that he tried to emulate and tried to build his profession on following them. And multitudes they interviewed today, and thousands already lined up in weeping and mourning as a result of the death. I'm not trying to in any way belittle the potentiality of great uh, uh, sorrow of the family and those that are connected with the man that died. That's not the point at all. But multitudes of youngsters today growing up are emulating folks like Magic Johnson, people like uh, Kobe Bryant, and multitudes in Hollywood and on television and even wanted to emulate uh, and fall in the footsteps of Nancy Pelosi. If you don't believe that, listen to the interview of Nancy Pelosi's daughter with the news media. You would think mom walked on water and that others wanted and the daughter wanted to emulate mom because mom was such a great leader and she was setting the example. 
We as believers ought to understand that the challenge from the Scripture, the mandate from the Scripture, the order from, uh, if you please, the heavenly portals of glory is that we emulate, that we follow, that we mimic God himself. That's what the Scripture is saying. We're not to copy some uh, favorite or famous person, uh, some movie star or someone like that. Notice not only the exhortation recorded, but notice the emulation required. Notice we're to mimic God. Notice, as dear children. That word dear simply means beloved, precious children. And the word there is technon, and we get the idea from that, a child. We are to emulate and follow God just as that child follows in the footsteps of dad. We're to emulate and to follow God, and we're to do so, and that emulation requires us, we as believers, to follow him step by step through his word. Now, we'll forget back many years ago, and I've used the illustration uh, probably dozens and dozens of times in different fashions. But never will forget they were advertising Marlboro cigarettes on television. And it showed a dad on a Saturday morning out with his, had his car parked on the front lawn, the grass. He had the hose going, and he was washing the car down. He laid the hose down and walked over and picked up a uh, pack of cigarettes, put a cigarette in his mouth and lit it and took a deep draw off the cigarette placed it back on the ashtray or the side of the porch, went back out and started washing the car. And the camera then panned back and showed that young son, looked like five or six years old, picked up one of the cigarettes out of the packet, didn't light it, put it in his mouth, and mimicking the exact style that Dad was doing and drawing on that cigarette. The idea behind the ad was to promote the smoking of the cigarettes, but the idea that I saw that was coming across very, very clear is here is a son that's following in the footsteps of dad, emulating dad, mimicking dad, doing what dad was doing. And that's what we see in society from the human standpoint, but the scripture says that we ought to emulate, we ought to mimic, we ought to copy and follow God himself. Many, many years ago, one of our sons and at one time, until I was corrected on it, I would call a son's name. And uh, one of them said on one occasion, Dad, stop, stop, stop calling my name from the pulpit, telling on me. Uh, but one of our sons, notice I didn't say my sons, one of our sons. My bride has corrected that a number of times. But one of our sons <laughs> was asked on one occasion, what do you want to do when you grow up? His answer, and I give you precisely, a preacher, a real estate man, a builder, just like my daddy. That is what children grow up seeing and wanting to emulate. And as a child of God, we need to grow up seeing the Word of God, hearing the Word of God, meditating on the Word of God, and knowing God through the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives. And we should want to emulate, to mimic, and to follow what God is saying and what God says that we're to do. Children in the human family most likely will emulate their parents. So also, in God's family, every believer is to copy, to emulate, and to mimic God. God is to be our model. God is to be our pattern. God, through his word, is to be what we emulate and want to follow. Not Hollywood, not a movie star, not society, but our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, as is found in God's word. We're to follow the principles of emulation, mimicking our Heavenly Father. Hebrews 1, 1, 2, 3 tells us this, tells us that Jesus is the express image of God the Father. Therefore, if we are emulating Christ, following Christ, we are following, emulating, mimicking God in our lives. Just like the Father, we are to be born of God through salvation, and therefore we are to emulate, to mimic, and to follow Him. Be ye holy as I am holy, God says. The principal concept revealed. Notice in verse 2, the premier copy replicated. Since we are to emulate the Father and imitate Him, we're to mimic Him, how are we to know how to be like Him? How are we to know how we should look like Him, act like Him, and talk like Him? Notice the example revealed in verse 2. And walk, it's talking about conduct, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Literally, we're to walk, and that walk word walk has the idea of our progression, our way of life, and our conduct. Our conduct and our walk and way of life should be in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, just like Christ loved us and died on Calvary's cross. We are to live our lives in a reflection of the Christ life as we see in the Scripture. 
In fact, in John 3.16, as you know, the verse, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And then we find in John 15.13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. That's how we are to emulate the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we're to mimic God. The Lord Jesus Christ is our supreme example of love on Calvary's cross. With his arms outstretched, nailed to Calvary's cross, he said, I love you this much. And that love was unwavering. That love is unending. That love is unfathomable. That love is a love that we cannot explain, cannot grasp, cannot fully understand. And that's the kind of love that Christ had for us. And the Bible is saying that if we're going to emulate Christ and mimic God and follow him, it should be evidence in our life and our walk, and that should be a walk and a life lived in love, loving the Lord Jesus Christ, loving others. In fact, in Romans 5, 8, God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We're to follow that example. Jesus' love for us is undeserved. Jesus' love for us is unending, it's unwavering, and it's total and complete. In fact, in First John 4, verse 7 and following gives us an idea of that. First John 4, verse 7, Beloved, let us, uh, let us love one another, for God is love, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifest this, the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the covering for our sins. And that's the kind of love that God has for us. And here we find the scripture says, as we look at the text, we understand the example where to walk in our conduct should love as Christ also loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Not only do we see the example revealed, but I want you to notice the explanation reflected. And hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Savor. What does that mean? What is it saying? Jesus' love is a sacrificial love, and he sacrificed himself on Calvary's cross that we might live through his death on Calvary's cross. Sweet-smelling savor, sweet odor, sweet fragrance. Literally, the phrase designates here the acceptance of God's offering, Jesus Christ's offering on Calvary's cross as the savor, the fragrance, going up to the portals of glory and meeting the requirements of the grand jury of all of heaven. It is simply saying that what Jesus Christ did on the cross was that sweet-smelling savor, that sacrifice that was on Calvary for your life and for mine. Jesus sacrificed on Calvary's cross. Please, God, it satisfied the law of God. And Jesus' love is what kept him on the cross. His love for you and for me kept him on the cross. Those nails did not hold Christ on the cross. Those soldiers did not prevent Christ from leaving the cross. He could have called 10,000 angels and released him from the cross. His love for you and for me kept Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. That love that is unfathomable, that love that cannot be understood, that love that is still unwavering, that love that is to the end. He loves us nearer and better than our next door neighbor, our nearest friend, our closest relative. He loves us enough to die for us. And as we follow Jesus' example, we're to love unselfishly, willingly, fully, without any reservation. We're to walk in love, the Scripture says. And our goal should be to love the Lord Jesus Christ and love others as he loved us. Romans 13, 8 says, He that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. The law. It's talking about the law of God. Our sacrifice of love will be acceptable to God. Now, our service and surrender and sacrifice should be fully, fully for the Lord Jesus Christ and his church. Most today, I feel, do not recognize the need to indicate our love for Christ 
in our worship and service and surrender under his sacrificial gift and death on Calvary's cross, that others might see Jesus in us with what we do and what we say. The principal concept revealed, the premier copy replicated. But I want you to notice in verse 3, 4, and 5, the bulk of the text has a little unusual flavor to it, if you will, has a little unusual directive found in it. The personal conduct restricted in verses 3, 4, and 5. It's an amazing thing and yet frightening that so many professing believers today will simply say, well, I love God, I love Jesus, I know I'm going to heaven, I'm a good man, I'm a good woman, I've done good deeds and I've done all that I can, and so everything is just absolutely all right. And yet there is a life that is lived and characteristics and conduct that is outside the parameter of anything that will be called emulating God through Jesus Christ in one's life. It's an amazing thing to me that we find so many in that category, professing believers that will tell you that they're free in Christ. And as a result of liberty in Christ, multitudes take license out of that liberty. We're free in Christ, but it's not a license to sin. It's not a license to live like the world. We see scripturally that God places restrictions on our personal conduct as Christians. And we see that in verse 3, 4, and 5. Notice the emphatic restrictions in verse 3 and 4. But, notice the but, English grammar, it's a contrast, it's a change of direction. He's talking about our mimicking Christ, following God, being obedient to him. And he says, but fornication and all uncleanliness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. The Apostle Paul lists these things. Again, I go back to the uh, astonishing fact that he's speaking to so-called Christians in the church. This letter, this epistle is written to those believers in the church at Ephesus. And you recall I made mention before that in Acts chapter 19 and 20 you find that as the Apostle Paul was leaving them at Ephesus, they were clinging onto his garments, pleading with him to remain. And he reminded them that in my going, the false teachers, the false prophets will come in like wolves and will take you down. My words, not the text. And that's exactly what took place in a short few years after the Apostle Paul left that ministry with them. But notice, he names these things, fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, let it not be named among you as becometh saints, not be once. That means banish it from your thought. Don't dare to think that you can live that lifestyle, that you can live in that perimeter of sin, and everything is okay. Not be once named among you. It's in, by the way, in the emphatic voice in the Greek text. It is don't let these things be named. Don't let them be found. It is unthinkable in the life of a Christian. It's unbecoming. It's unthinkable. What are these things he's talking about? Number one, the believer's conduct. Paul lists three things that a believer is not to have in his life. Believers are to abstain from Number one, abstain from sexual immorality. Now, I know that is an absolute no-no in the modern, current, 21st century mindset of Christianity in most churches today. It's not looked at as being somehow, some way, these verses are not looked at. Somehow, some way, these, uh, this part of the Scripture is simply absent from most Bibles and most denominations today where simply there is a rampant sense of if it's happening in the world, I've got to embrace it in the church so that we can fill the pews and fill the offering plate and everything's all right. Well, I want us to understand when you preach this text uh, and do so based on the authority of the Word of God, you will narrow down the number dramatically of those that want to be involved in that local New Testament church. Because in today's society, where the LGBTQ absolutely dominates most of our denominations, we have a society of people with less than 4% in society in that category of sinful lifestyle, and yet the churches are bowing and bending and embracing and celebrating that lifestyle today. But the Bible says, emphatically so, abstain from sexual immorality. That word fornication, pornea, it's talking about any illicit sexual activity. Fornication at one time. Many of the old theologians said that was having sexual relationship uh, before marriage, outside of marriage, and then adultery, sexual relationship in within marriage. No, no, no. The word fornication is the umbrella word for any sexual sin 
any sexual sin outside of the will of God, the way of God, and the word of God. We live in a t tolerant society today, Then this sense of tolerance has permeated the church. We see so-called believers today living together outside of marriage and think that it's all right. The church at Corinth did the very same thing. You studied the book of 1 Corinthians to look at the fifth chapter. They had a young lad that was living in an incestuous relationship with his stepmother, and the folks at Corinth said, well, we just love him so much, we're going to embrace him, and it's okay, keep him in church, it's all right. Paul said, no, put him out of the church. Let Satan have his body that his soul might be saved. May I remind us, we need to be careful. The idea is somehow, some way, we love folks too much to point out sin. You're just judging me, some will tell us. Some view it as okay, as natural, and yet God's Word says it's not okay. It's not natural to be named among, among the believers. It is not okay. It is not natural for sexual sin to be permeating the life and the heart of believers. And yet we find today in society, from kindergarten up uh, through uh, high school and uh, high, through college and university, we find today with the LGBTQ, they're teaching these our sons and our daughters and our grandkids all manner of illicit, ungodly, unholy uh, acts, sexual acts, and saying that it's all right. And yet we wonder why there's so many teen pregnancies. We wonder why there's so many teens on drugs today. It's because they're being indoctrinated with that. That's what's being taught in our schools today. And most parents could care less. Let that yellow bus pick them up uh, each morning and bring them back each afternoon. Take them out of my hair. I'm not worried about it. It doesn't matter what they're learning. It's free education, and it must be all right. You ever wondered why it's called free education? My bride can tell you for the past 50 years I've called it governmentally controlled schools. And if they control the school, they, control, they can control what's being taught and what goes into the mush minds that causes them to be the little renegades that they are in society today. And as a result of that, we see that mindset permeating the families, permeating the homes, permeating the schools. And now it has broken into the doorways of our churches, permeating the churches today. And it was so in the days of the Apostle Paul when he wrote this epistle. You would not think so, but it was. Why else would he be writing this to the church at Ephesus? May I remind us today, we have couples telling about how long they've been together. You ever asking about how long, well, how long have you been married? Well, we've been together 25 years. What does that mean? It means you're living in an illicit, ungodly, unholy relationship that God's Word says, no, you cannot do that. We see the increase today of the sodomite lifestyle because of what's being taught and done through the LGBTQ and Planned Parenthood that our churches have embraced. We even have today the sodomite pastors and priests and leaders and membership. May I remind us the Apostle Paul dealt with the same similar context and text in 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, Verse 9 and 10. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither uh, fornicators, nor idolaters, nor idolaters, nor the effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. It's almost the same list that is given here that the Apostle Paul is hammering on in relationship to the New Testament church and what was happening. They ought to be they ought to abstain from sexual immorality, abstain from sensual impurities also. Notice he says their uncleanliness. Uncleanliness literally is the word for impure. It's talking about an impure lifestyle. What are some of the impurities? It's drugs and drinking and pornography and that uh, uh, clubbing, as some of them call it. I'm, well, where you been? Well, I've been clubbing. <laughs> what does it mean? I've been going out into the world and living a worldly lifestyle. Back a number of years ago, in fact, it was back in the 60s, late 60s, early 70s, pastor was talking about he had gone into the bar rooms and lounges and somebody said, why did you do it? Well, I just wanted to see what sin looked like and what they were doing. We don't have to get down to the hog pen to know what the hogs are like. And yet there are a number of folks today that have that philosophy and feeling, I've got to really see what they're doing so I know how to preach against it. That is, Greek word for that is horse feathers. That's simply not so at all. We, are, uh, we see some of these impurities that's taking place today, and it's in the life and living of so many that call themselves Christians. Christians. 
I say to any so-called Christian, if you claim that you're a Christian, look like it, act like it, talk like it, walk like it, be what Christ is like, and emulate and imitate and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only abstain from sexual immorality and abstain from sensual impurities, but also abstain from selfish insatiabilities. Covetousness, that means greed, gravis. It means a lust for more. It means what we used to call hoggish or piggish. You ever heard that term? That shows where you're from, the country or the city. <laughs> you, ever, you ever seen a hog trough and there's a bunch of little piglets over here and mama hog and uh, the farmer comes and pours the trough full of food and all of them come and rush and there might be enough room for about 10 lined up on either side, and there's one or two that's extra, and they keep rooting the other one out, pushing the other one out, because he wants to get there and get the food before the others do. And well, that's what we're talking about here, covetousness. It means wanting what someone else has, looking at what someone else is driving, looking at where they live, look at what they wear, look at where they go, et cetera, et cetera, and wanting the same thing. Somebody said, on one occasion said, I can keep up with the Joneses until the Joneses refinance. <laughs> It's difficult to keep up with the Joneses, and that's what we're talking about here. It is covetousness, and it's listed here with immorality and impurity. The Bible says greed or lust is wanting more and more and more, and it's in the same light with the same seriousness of the other sins that's listed here. A person with an insatiable pursuit to gain and to get and to gather. Have you ever watched a television program that's called American Greed? It's fascinating to watch. Um... Uh, I don't see it every week, but it's on each week, I understand. And it's the uh, following of those that have been so insatiably gripped by greed that they will lie, cheat, and steal, and on some occasions up into the hundreds of millions of dollars built from the general public before they finally get caught, tried, convicted, and put in prison. It's because of greed that motivates that. It's greed that motivates the wanting to get what someone else has. It's the greed that wants to get and to gain and together without having to work for it. It does not require truth or justice or honesty or concern for the well-being of others. It's just me, myself, and I wanting to get and to gain. Our society today may tolerate the sins that we find in government, may pass laws of some of these sins, but the legitimacy of it is not found any place in the Word of God. God says they are not to be found even once among the believers. The believer's conduct, but I want you to notice the believer's communication in the fourth verse. Believer's talk should also please the Lord. Believers should abstain from corrupt communication also. Notice, abstain from shameful talk in that fourth verse. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, that is, literally means not beneficial, are not benefiting at all. Filthiness means shameful, obscene, filthy speech. Believers should not be telling filthy jokes or being involved in the filthy communication of our culture today. The dirty jokes seem to be a commonplace for people to talk about uh, uh, that which is uh, obscene, that which is uh, immoral and ungodly, and there seems to be a mindset today, and it seems to have gotten out in the open. If you don't believe that, just watch some of the television where every other word is an absolute filthy, vile, ungodly, unholy word, and it seems to be part of the general communication and conversation today and you'd be surprised and maybe you wouldn't how many Christians fall into that same category of that same kind of communication that is corrupt that ought not to be neither filthiness nor foolish think talking nor jesting which are not convenient or fitting before the Lord gutter language I call it seems to be the norm today uh, even among Christians even among believers vulgar talk today would have been banned 20, 30, 40 years ago but it's all over television. In fact, some of our uh, prestigious anchors on television today are using vile words in the communication, and it seems to be acceptable and okay. At one time, it was not. They would not speak that way, not communicate that way. The kind of talk that would be found on television and movies today. Abstain from shameful talk. Secondly, abstain from silly talk nor foolish talking. Foolish talking literally, mean, literally means uh, silly talk, uh, the talk of fools. When it says foolish talking, 
always clowning, never serious, always flippant in their conversation. Flippant conversation seems to be the habit with so many today rather than taking a serious aspect and a serious mindset of what the Christian life ought to be like and what God calls upon us to be as Christians. And then abstain from suggestive talk, jesting. You want to know what jesting is? It's clever cutting remarks or signs that you've uh, seen some of this if you've not been out on the highways in Jacksonville or other places. You can find some filthy jesting because they want to wave at you out the window. <laughs> and it's amazing to me how many Christians partake in the filthy jesting, not just about a thing or to make it a frequent conversation to introduce or into the mind, but it also has to do with bringing uh, nearer to doing something as they are jesting about it. It is the communication that's suggestive of that innuendo or the plain deception of that which is in the heart. We do and say that which is from the abundance of the heart. What the heart feels and what the heart thinks comes out of the mouth. The scripture warns that believers' conduct and communication is to honor God, the verse 4 says, but rather giving thanks. It is the contrary, it's the contrast. Rather than doing these things with the filthy communication and the foolish talking and the jesting which is not uh, uh, beneficial, but rather... If you, in other words, if you're going to open your mouth and say something, let it be a word of praise and thanksgiving and praising God for who you are and what he's done in our lives as saving us. Something that blesses and benefits others is what we ought to have. Not what I call the gutter standards of society, but following our Savior who sets the standards of God in and for our lives. Notice in that fifth verse, not only do we see the emphatic restrictions, but notice the effectual reminder in verse 5 as we close. For, the Greek word gar, because, says, why is, he, why is Paul saying these things? Because this ye know, that no whoremonger, one who practices sexual immorality, one who prostitutes his body or her body to another in lust, nor unclean person, that means impure, filthy before God, nor covetous man, that is greedy, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Paul says, why did I tell you this? Because I want to warn you, dear church member, professing Christian, that all of these things I've just warned you about, if that is the lifestyle and living in your life, keep in mind you will not inherit the kingdom of God. It is an awesome warning. It is a dreadful warning. And yet we have multitudes today that perhaps have never read this or they could care less. God says, okay, that's uh, your claim. You claim to be saved. There are spiritual external uh, shows and shines in your life. There are those things that are internal that ought to be. And the external consequences for immoral, impure, idolatrous living is that you're lost, 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 and not saved. It's a staggering thought when you analyze our lives as Christians in light of what the Scripture says. Do we measure up? Can a person look at your life and mine and say, there is a saved man, a saved woman. Look at their talk, look at their walk, look at their lifestyle, look at their conduct, look at their characteristics. It looks like, they act like, and talk like Jesus Christ. They're mimicking Christ in their lives. Paul is saying here, as he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, those who live lives of impurity and immorality and greed, even as a church member, are not saved at all. It's a horrible warning. He says, no inheritance, no inheritance, literally, no reward, no eternal life, no salvation at all. The meaningless motion of baptism and attendance and church membership will not get any human being into that place called heaven. Our lives should emulate that of the Lord Jesus Christ. We should mimic him 
in our walk and in our talk. How many of us, I don't need a show of hands or amen. <laughs> How many of us fall short of the characteristics and the conduct required in Scripture to evidence our salvation and our relationship to Jesus Christ? I pray that we'll use this as a good lesson to learn from and allow it to be the direction in our lives, even tomorrow, as we walk before the world and saying to the world, we represent Jesus Christ. Would you stand?